But if you're on stage, if you're on the boards, you have to get the thought across because this playwright had this in mind when he wrote it. And you, you making a joke, you're actually, you're, you're butchering his work and that's not fair. And if I came into your place of work and made fun of what you're doing, you probably wouldn't appreciate it. When we're trying to do this justice, maybe you don't appreciate it, but, but the other 99% might. Welcome to the Paul Plett Podcast. This is basically an excuse for me to sit down and have a conversation with people that I find interesting. And joining me today is Chuck Fefchak. How you doing? <laughs> I'm good. Chuck is a salesperson. Yes. An actor. Sure. And an all-around good guy. Nice guy. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome here, Chuck. Thanks for having me to the Paul Plett Podcast. You gotta be careful. It's <laughs> a good name. I it like is. it. Um, Chuck, how's it going? You know, for people who don't know you, who have never met you, how would you describe who you are and what do you do? Uh, I'm I'm the Honda guy in Winkler. I've been at Southland Honda in Winkler now for coming on 23 years. Okay, Winkler, uh, small town, big town. Well, it's a city. City. It's a big town. City in Manitoba. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's down on uh, number three highway, southeastern Manitoba, mm -hmm. ditzied of the Red River. <laughs> so you've been at Honda Winkler. I've been affiliated with Honda for 30 years, but I've been at Southland Honda for just about 23. Wow. I worked in two other dealerships prior to that. So that's what I do. and and. Uh, the, the previous owner, uh, Greg Enns, and I did a... You ever seen the uh, Zach Galifianakis Between Two Ferns? Yeah. We were the two Honda guys between two trees because we had these really hokey artificial trees and we'd do a... Every Thursday morning we'd do a, uh, a little video. Really? For YouTube to promo the dealership. And it was usually... It started out where he was the straight guy and I didn't tell him what I was going to do. And I... Yeah. We, we were pr promoting our pud and... Puck and Spud contest. Okay. You buy a car in yeah. this month and you get a box of potatoes <laughs> and, and season passes to the Winkler Flyers. Okay. So I didn't tell them what uh, we, Hockey team? Yeah, okay. hockey team in Winkler. I didn't tell them what I was going to do. We're in jerseys and I got a hockey stick. I said, just introduce us. And, mm -hmm. and I did this terrible French-Canadian hockey player accent. Uh, and then he thought that was pretty funny. So then I became the straight guy. It wasn't as funny. I'm just <laughs> That's but we did that for a few years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My dad used to do these um, plays in sort of the Steinbach area, you know, like low German plays and stuff. And he always he did this. This there was this bit called Kaupenbua. You know any Kaupenbua plays? I have never even heard the term. It's like a low German. It, it again, just you know what's Bua. Bua? I, they're the names of two characters. Oh, I, okay. yeah, Kaupen, Kupen, I don't know, Bua? <laughs> Bua. <laughs> but but uh, my dad loved, he always talks about how he would just love going off script and just, yeah. then whoever's going, whoever's locked to the script, you just sort of see them. Oh, the fear gets in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah and, uh, yeah, I've done a lot of shows with guys that apparently have the scripts on the inside of their eyelids because when they get lost, uh, <laughs> it's not up there, man. It's supposed to be in here. You gotta look. <laughs> so, as an actor, are you? You're more of a, like you're a character actor. Then you like to get into the part. Yeah, yeah. And then I, you could do anything, say anything. Yeah, I, I. Well, I try to stay close to the sure. script, but as you're probably aware, I am so not verbatim. It's I'll get the thought to you. Yeah. And I'll hit your, if, if it needs to be said in a specific manner, I'll give you that. But I mean, if we put you in a Winkler Flyers jersey and you have a hockey stick and there's a box of potatoes next to you, you can just go. Sky's the limit. There. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, I, 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 I've done a, a few plays in my time. Yes. Yeah. So, so where were you born? Where'd you grow up? Uh, those are two different questions. Okay. Uh, where I was born was Verdon, Manitoba, and I'll let you know when I've grown up. <laughs> <laughs> Where's Verdon? Verdon is on the Trans-Canada Highway, about 40 minutes west of Brandon. Okay. Uh, my, my joke is it Verdon. Brandon. It's a nice city. place to be from. That should be on the sign outside the town, eh? Verdon, it's a nice place to be from. <laughs> <laughs> Why is that? 
you, if, well, you've probably grown up in enough small towns, and yeah. everybody seems to know your business, and yeah. and they don't, yeah. so they make crap up. So, uh, I mean, do I miss it? Sure, my family's there. Yeah, uh, like my, I've, I've got three siblings living there, and okay. and aunts and uncles and cousins to beat the band. But it's nice to get away from your hometown, spread your wings. How long were you in Britain for? Uh, born in 63 on the farm yeah. and then moved to town. I moved away in 85 and then came back in 92 for about four or five more years. You moved away at 85. Yeah. I, uh, that's when I was born. <laughs> I bought a restaurant that year. <laughs> really? Yeah. Where? Uh, Russell, Manitoba, which is on the Yellowhead, about an hour and 20 minutes north on the 83 highway. Okay. Um, I was the fourth ever franchise chicken chef owner operator. Oh my goodness. Right. Wow. Yeah. I got a job uh, as an assistant manager when I was 17 uh -huh. at the Chicken Chef in Verdon, which is yes. the second store. And uh, after three or four years, I, I decided that, no, I, I don't want to listen to your dang orders anymore. I want to be my own boss. Yeah. So we found a place and I... Who's we? Uh, my partner was my boss, Greg, mm -hmm. Greg Jackson. Mm -hmm. um, he, he started in the flagship Chicken Chef, which was in Carmen, Manitoba, just okay. north of Morden. And uh, he moved to Verdon. Opened is up that where Chicken Chef is from, from Carmen? Chicken Chef was 1978. It was opened in Carmen, Manitoba. Okay. Now, how do I remember 1978? Well, I... That's so lame. <laughs> it's a big um, year for Chicken yeah, Chef. I guess, yeah. I guess. Um, and so... I proved my mettle, I guess. Uh, okay. When they opened up a store in Thompson, Manitoba, I went yeah. up there as a field manager and trained the staff and the management yeah. on how to set up, how yeah. to set up a kitchen, how to blah blah blah. And then, uh, then I went back to Verdon yeah. and said I want to do my own thing. Yeah. And we had found a store that actually the bank had closed. Uh huh. Uh, so we, I started from ground zero, like cleaning every. Uh, nook and cranny yeah. and crook and nanny and <laughs> it was uh, and turned a store that was basically abandoned by the public yeah that's why they locked it yeah uh and turned it into one of the busiest joints in town it had one of those suspended ceilings and at coffee time those things would just vibrate i don't know if you figured it out but i'm a rather loud person so. <laughs> this is and this is in russell yeah Okay, where is Russell? Russell's north on 83 Highway, uh -huh. off the Trans Canada, just outside of Verdon, and you just drive up to the Yellowhead. Do they have that big statue of the bull? Of the bull, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And there's like an A and W, right? Right. Well, there. the A and W wasn't there. That used to be Prairie Picture Frame. Okay. Shout out to the, the Langford family. Yeah. Um, but yeah, they 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 had a little building there, and now there's an A and W there. Wow. And, and if you drive through Nipawa on yeah. the Yellowhead yeah. and then keep driving to Russell, you will see twin stores because Nipawa was the first chicken corral okay. and they built a clone in Russell. Wow. Yeah. Same square footage. The only difference is Nipawa is now put on an atrium on the front. <sighs> Did they make a documentary about this? Probably not. Just it's Faf Chat. It's not the worth chicken talking chef story. Yeah. Well, it's weird because I have a sister-in-law who ever since well she was dating my brother when i was born yeah so i've been charlie chicken and it was and and then i bought a chicken restaurant and wow and all my buds back home yeah like my family calls me charlie okay and most in my professional world i'm chuck as a yeah. rule, as a rule and and i don't really don't have a preference it's yeah. just it sounds cool and nobody ever forgets chuck yeah i forget the last name yeah um and all my buddies just call me Chicken Man, which, really? which has been kind of, I don't know, shortened. When they say it, it's like Ching Man. It's like almost one syllable, Ching Man. Really? <laughs> was that from growing up or was that? No, that's when I started working in the, in the Chicken Chef in Verdon. Okay, okay. And one of my buddy's kids, who is now like, geez, he's got to be 35 years old. Yeah. And he, is that the Chicken Man? And it's stuck. <laughs> So you're the chicken man. I'm the chicken man. That's our thumbnail for our video. <laughs> I'm the chicken man. <laughs> Cuckoo, kachu. <laughs> so, so okay. So, 
Uh, can you tell me anything else about growing up, uh, childhood in Verdon? What was it like? Well, I grew up on the farm. Mm -hmm. uh, ten, outside of Verdon. Outside of Verdon. Mm -hmm. uh, what kind of farm? Uh, mixed farming operation. Okay. Like, uh, you know, the laying hens mm -hmm. and then, of course, butchering. Mm -hmm. And uh, like a potato. We had 25 rows of potatoes. Mm -hmm. Each was about a quarter mile long. Do you want to guess whose job it was to pick the potato bugs in Fatahan? Fatahan is Port Chalaka, by the way. Um, that was my job. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I kind of grew into it. Um, we had a big garden. We did, my mom preserved everything. Mm -hmm. um, and we obviously had a lot of potatoes and we sold a bunch, but mm -hmm. we always had two bins, one bin of whites and a bin of reds down in the basement. Okay. Um, we milked cows. Yeah. So in the springtime, when the cows are freshening and they've had their calves and they're they really have a lot of milk, you're up at 5.30 in the morning, so yeah. I'm still an early riser. Mm -hmm. um, when 10, 10 miles used to be 100. Yeah. Like you, you, we went to town once a week. Mm -hmm. Town being? Verdon. Okay. Uh, and, and it was a trip to Verdon mm -hmm. where mom would sell fresh eggs and pints and quarts of cream mm -hmm. to uh, a callers that would call out to the farm and say, you know, this is Katie Garzales. I need a quart of cream and two dozen eggs. Wow. And from there, uh -huh. mom went to the Valley View Co-op and bought the week's worth of groceries that we needed. And this is the 60s? Uh, I was born in 63, so the late 60s, early 70s. We late moved, 60s, we moved 70s. in 74. Dad sold the farm. Okay. So this but, is the late 60s, early 70s version of a CSA. Sure. Yeah. Uh, and, and to this day, puffed wheat, uh, I won't eat it. Okay. Because, you know, when you're selling eggs and cream to get the staples from week to week, yeah. you buy the puffed wheat that's as big as this table uh -huh. for a dime. So that's what your breakfast was. Mm. Gosh, I hate puff wheat. I don't even like puff wheat cake. <laughs> Everybody likes puff wheat cake, right? <laughs> no puff wheat. Okay. <laughs> Copy that. So, growing up on the farm, um, when, when did you, I mean, it seems like kind of your first... The first thing you ended up sort of following was sort of business sales in a way. When did that kind of, was that already when you were helping, did you help your mom selling any of this stuff? No, I, I, I did, I, my job, I was, I was the manual laborer, Okay. Uh, you know, uh, as well as all my siblings. Yeah. Uh, you know, that's your, how many siblings? Uh, there's five of us. Okay. And the kid, you, the kid sister. Where are you in the? I'm second from last. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so th by the time we moved off the farm, my kid sister really hadn't got into it. Okay. She was still the spoiled brat kid sister. Gotcha. That's what happens. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she's going to, she's going to get me for that one. <laughs> I'm um, the youngest in my family. So. Yeah. Well, but I'm, I'm sure you're not spoiled. <laughs> <laughs> this guy loves a camera. <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah, we, we would, you know, You'd go and pick eggs yeah. three times a day. You'd yeah. milk cows twice a day. Mm -hmm. And in between then, if it was summertime, you'd, after morning milking, you'd run them out to the pasture and yeah. then run, run yourself back, yeah. fire down some groceries down your gullet, and get cleaned up and catch the bus, mm -hmm. uh, repeat until the snow flew. And then, yeah. and then the cows, you could just let them out and they'd go to the feedlot in, yeah. in back of the bush. So when do you start, yeah, I mean, sounds like, when do you start working at, at Chicken Chef? When does that sort of enter into your life and start? I graduated in 81 uh -huh. and uh, I had a job working at the local Valley View Co-op. I was a, a shack bangle. Okay. I, I did oil changes and, and fixed flat tires and, yeah. and sold oil and whatnot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Shack from, bangle. Yeah, that's Jack like the bulge. gopher. Yeah. gopher yeah. Here, do this. Yeah. Uh, from, from the gas bar slash service station, I also ended up working in the farm and agro center when they needed help. Okay. I worked in the self-serve bar. And then I got a job in the actual grocery store. So f I never knew. Like if you worked in the grocery store, you always wore a shirt and tie. Yeah. Obviously, you didn't do that if you were working in the garage. Yeah. So I would go to work and, and have to go home and change because, no, we don't need you here today. They need you in the grocery store. So I was in the grocery store when wow. this, a former school teacher uh -huh. came in 
uh, he was our old football coach. We called him the saddest. Uh-huh. Uh, Why? Because he was one. Okay. <laughs> he ran he ran guerrilla warfare football. To, and I wasn't on the team. Oh, like a sadist. Oh, yeah. Okay. Sadist. Saddest. thought saddest, like an Eeyore type character. No, no, no. In fact, he signed my high school yearbook. This is the saddest moment of my life. S-A-D-I-S-T. Whoa. Hilarious. Yeah, yeah. Um, he said they're looking for assistant manager at the Chicken Chef downtown. Yeah. That's the place where the 7-Eleven used to be. You should go and talk to them. Mm-hmm. And I did, and I got the job. So I, uh, when I was 17, I moved from Valley View Co-op to the Chicken Chef. Uh-huh. And then I was 21 when I bought my restaurant. Why? Why? Yeah. Uh, I don't, I don't like bosses so much. At least I was, I was. And did you learn that having all those different jobs and having all those bosses? No, I just, I, I as a, as an assistant manager, you're on a salary. So it's, yeah. it's not nine to five. Yeah. It's, you know, eight to whenever you're finished, uh-huh. whenever you can actually get out of there. Mm-hmm. And I figured if I'm going to work those kind of hours mm-hmm. and then, you know, go back, cash out at the end of the night and then clean underneath the canopy and be there till two in the morning and still be back. I might as well do it for myself, right? Mm, mm-hmm. Why am I letting this guy mm-hmm. take the lion's portion? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I mean, Chicken Chef at the time was expanding. Yeah. And I basically got in on the ground floor. Wow. I feel like I don't know. I didn't know Chicken Chef was from Manitoba. Yeah. And I like. I feel like this story needs to be told. The story of Chicken Chef and I, Manitoba. And I, I, I'll, I'll get you some numbers after the podcast. Yeah. Um. So. Growing up, I mean, it makes sense. You're growing up on the farm. Pretty, I mean, there's a lot of work. It's hard work. It, it gave you a good work ethic. But it's also really independent. You know, you're also... Right. You but know, there's no doubt who's in charge. Yeah, yeah. but... And, and it's not Charlie. <laughs> not the chicken boy. Not the chicken man. <laughs> the chicken man, sorry. So, so uh, you kind of have this sense of independence. Mm-hmm. You have this strong work ethic. You, you're sort of, you're, you're excited about possibilities. You buy a chicken chef and you move to Russell. Right. How'd Didn't know a soul. It, it, well, when you, when you're purchasing. How far is Russell from Verdon? About an hour and 20 minutes. Okay. So you knew Russell? Not at all. Wow. Didn't know a soul when I moved there. Not a single solitary soul. But that's okay. I didn't know a single solitary soul when I moved to Morden. So. Okay. How did, how the move to Russell go? Um. Very little consequence. I, I got. I, st- I stayed in in uh, the hotel because the place that I was going to rent yeah. wasn't available. Uh-huh. So I spent uh, about seven or eight weeks living in the hotel. Okay. I moved in in September. It snowed like a foot the second week of September, and the opening date was October the fifth. I mean, they they were plowing the streets. Uh, in September. It was a mm-hmm. massive snowstorm. It all went away, mm-hmm. but obviously with snow comes cold and, and the guy that owned the hotel at the time just hadn't got around to firing up the boiler. It was freezing, wow. freezing in my room every night and I'd have to shower in the hottest shower and then get out and leave the bathroom door open just yeah. so I have enough heat yeah. to get dressed. It was oh. awful, but it was obviously on top of a beverage room. Uh-huh. So one, and I love telling this story. Okay. Uh, and, and I'm going to use a Ukrainian accent. It's not to make fun, but there was two Ukrainian gentlemen sitting at the bar. As I found out in later years, they probably owned the stools they were sitting on. It was like Norm from Cheers, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and they're sitting there, and I'm, I'm, I'm having like burger fries, and, and I, I got a beer, and I'm just eating. It's about 7, 8 o'clock at night. And, uh, and you're like early 20s. Yeah, yeah, and, I, and I'm and I'm having my supper, and one of the guys says to the other guy, "You know, Walter, it was ten degrees today." And Walter says, "In Celsius? No, no, right here in Russell." <laughs> like I'm mean, that's a true story. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that that's that's. <laughs> It was okay. Yeah, it was okay yeah, yeah. because there was lots of fodder for an imaginative brain. <laughs> so have you always, like, imaginative brain, have you always kind of had that as well? I, I guess I have. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, when I was still on the farm in the early 70s, I was outside with my coho hockey stick and ramming an orange ball into a fence. And if mm-hmm. it stuck in there, it was a goal. And I was Guy Lafleur. I was Jacques Lemaire. I was, I was all them guys. In the yeah. world. So I had the imagination. But it didn't lead me to do anything theatrical until, well, I would have been about 19, I guess. Okay. And what was that? Um, it was a dare. 
Okay. I was I was dared. The, we used to play Trivial Pursuit, like the original Genus edition. It was a Monday night tradition. A bunch of buddies would gather at this house. Okay. And it had gone late. Yeah. And uh, well, we, it's like midnight. Why don't we just come back tomorrow and finish it up? Okay. I was winning, see. So I wanted to finish the game. And my friend Henry uh, said, I can't. I got theater practice. Yeah. And I went, what kind of crap is that? Yeah. Not my exact words, but I'm yeah. cleaning it up for you. <laughs> and uh, he said, well, yeah, I'm, I'm going to be in a play. I bet you can't do it. I bet you I can. So I went to theater rehearsal and, and got a role in, in, a, in the first play I ever did, in wow. the Odd Theater in Verdun, where if you haven't been to the Odd Theater in Verdun, go. Okay. Like it's, you won't, it's, it's like the Burt a little bit smaller mm -hmm. with, you know, loges. Bert, Burton Cummings like Theater. Like the Burton Cummings Theater. Here in Winnipeg. It's got the stamped ceiling, like stamped wow. copper ceiling. Yeah. Um, it's a beautiful venue. Wow. It's been restored a couple of times. Um, they're trying to get the seats done. Yeah. Because I'm pretty sure those seats are 100 years old. Yeah. So how was the, how that first, I guess it made an impact, this first play. This first I just period. had so much fun. Yeah. Um, it was a little bit more loosey-goosey than what I do nowadays. Okay. Uh, because it's a small town, right? Like yes. 15, 1,700 people. Everybody knows who Chuck Fefchuk is. Everybody yeah. knows who Colin Campbell is and Barry Stewart. Yeah. So every night there was a trick being played on someone. Okay. Every night. Like, put your shoulder into it. I've been putting my shoulder into this thing for three nights, and I haven't moved it yet. You do it. Yeah. You know? and, then, and then, you know, deer in the headlights. Okay, I'll do it. I'll do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the crowd were looking forward to, oh, what kind of jokes are they going to play each other? Interesting. Yeah, I, I, it all comes back. I had to eat. Do you know the show, The Importance of Being Earnest? It's a, I know of it. Okay, there's a, there's a scene in there. Wait, yeah, 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 I've read it, yeah. Where Algernon has to eat all the cucumber sandwiches before his Aunt Augusta comes. It, it's okay. part. It's part of the plot. They okay. have to be gone. Okay. Well, they put jalapenos, and I got to eat these things. Yeah. And whew, so I paid for that. that was good. We did. Uh, we did. The name of the play was called Busybody. Uh huh. And uh, I just had a bit part. I was like a lieutenant officer. This is all in Verdun. Yeah. And so when you moved to Russell. How was that? Well, weird, weirdly enough, like, had theater kind of become a part of your identity at that I looked, point? Yeah, not yet. Okay. I, 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 it was I just looked, a fun thing to do. It was just a fun thing yeah. to do, and all my friends just couldn't, you know, like, on the weekends, you're this crazy party animal, and then Monday, you're gone to rehearsal? Like, how do you remember all those lines? Yeah. Well, I'm not loaded anymore, so <laughs> I can. Gotcha. Um, during the few years that I was doing it in Verdun, there was a, a very uh, very Scotch lawyer. Mm -hmm. He had the he had the drool right down here. Yeah, and he was a bit of a, an artsy fartsy guy. Gotcha. And he wrote a play called The King, which was the story of the cri uh, trial of Christ from Pontius Pilate's point of view. And he guesses Whoa. who was playing Pontius. <laughs> I've played him five different times. Okay. They they're trying to tell me something. Um, so we, uh, what is now considered Act Fest, we went to one of the very first ones with this play. Okay. And uh, what's Act Fest? Act Fest is the Association of Community Theaters. Okay. And it's just it's a an adjudicated. There's no winner nor loser. Yeah. Where does it take place? Uh, well, it always used to take place in Winnipeg. Okay. We did it at the Warehouse Theater. It's like a Manitoba. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, but they've Winkler has hosted it. Verdon has hosted it. It's yeah. been up. The, I've only done two of them, and the last of which we went up to uh, Dauphin. Wow. And, and did it up there. Okay. It's just, you have like an hour uh -huh. to put a play on. Okay. Uh, and it's just so it's a, like Fringe. It's, yeah. It's an exhibition, not a competition. Okay. Um, so the, when I moved to Russell, Alex Aiken moved his law office to Russell. Okay. Within about a year. Wait, Alex Aiken, is this the Scottish This is guy? a Scottish guy. The, who wrote the king. Who wrote the king. Who made you Pontius, uh, Pontius Pilate. 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 And then... We, we met uh -huh. and we started talking about doing some other stuff and yeah. he, he wrote, you know, stuff. He, he wrote a play called, and I can't remember what it was, but it's, it's about the oil boom that hit Verdun in the 50s. Mm. <coughs> and all these slicksters from, from uh, big cities were coming out and buying up rights to drill oil on people's okay. land. And he wrote this play. Uh, I, played, I played the land, uh, the land buyer. 
that was trying to get lease rights. Gotcha. And he played the tight Scottish farmer. I can't remember what his name, but I, my name was Dan Chuchukavich. And I fell in love with the farmer's daughter. Gotcha. It was just a play that he had written. And yeah, let's do that. And, and then he wrote, a, he, he was a historian, yeah. a bit of a buff that way. So yeah. he, we did a whole thing on, uh, on the life and times of John A. MacDonald, where wow. he sat in behind a scrim, yeah. uh, and backlit. So it's just a, 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 a shadow of him in a rocking chair yeah. telling stories in, in yeah. a Scottish accent. Yeah. And then we did a couple of conventional three-act plays just for shiggles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you're doing all kinds of plays in Verdon. You moved to Russell, and we kind of we didn't even have a name for the club. It was just uh, this bunch of idiots. Yeah. And then afterwards, we you know have a beer and talk about it. Yeah. And then when I moved back to Verdon, when did you move back to Verdon? How long were you in Russell for? I was in Russell seventy uh, eighty five to eighty nine, okay. and then in eighty nine I moved up to Thompson to help this guy who I had trained to open up his chicken chef. I stayed okay. there one winter. Okay. Not only did I know that I didn't want to live there in the wintertime, but this guy was just as lazy as the day that I trained him. <laughs> so I, I got out and I moved actually back to Russell where I got a job uh, working at a grocery store there. Did you sell the franchise, move on? Yeah. Okay. yeah the, Someone else took over. Yeah, I got a, I got a phone call from my partner. Uh huh. And he said, uh, do you want to sell the store? And I said, why would I want to sell the store? We've just turned it into the, the boominess place in, mm -hmm. in the, well, they're going to offer you this much. I says, I got my keys in my hand and I'm ready to go. <laughs> um, so then I, when I left Thompson, I moved back to Russell. I got a shop uh, job at the grocery store. Okay. Doing my thing there. And, and then uh, when I got tired of that and, and uh, it showed, they canned me. Only job I've ever been canned from. Wow. Uh, and so I, then I moved back to Verdon because I found a job uh, uh, actually working at the kid that said, is that the chicken man? Yeah, his dad owned the hotel in, in Verdon, so oh, I got okay. a job uh, as an assistant manager there, slinging drinks and cooking and doing banquets and whatnot. Okay, okay. The chicken man returns. Yeah, kind of. Um, and then you kind of, and you fell back in with the theater. Well, no, because during that span of time, the director. Was that five years? Uh, yeah, it'd be from 80, 85 to about nine, about six and a half, seven years. Okay. The, 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 the impetus had kind of waned. Gotcha. Uh, the director was tired of being the director. It's a place and time sometimes. Yeah and, yeah, and so there was really not much going on. Mm -hmm. um, a friend of mine who, whose name is Jody Zarn, lives okay. in Winnipeg, uh, very artsy, artsy person yeah. and funny. Uh -huh. um, she, she and I and her mom and a couple of other people did some shticks. Mm -hmm. You know, the Legion would have a fundraiser for the, I don't know, whatever little thing and we'd, we'd put on some entertainment. Yeah. Just yeah. sputting. Yeah. Um, it wasn't. What do you mean just sputting? Like, sputting, like just, just like, fooling around. Just improvising or? Some of it was improv, yeah. Yeah. Um, but just entertaining kind of for how long? An hour? No, we would do like a 20 minute sketch. Oh, okay. And then, then they'd have the boring speakers. Yeah, and yeah. And then yeah. we would come back and do another 20 wow. minute sketch. That's gotta feel good. Uh, that was all right. You're the thing people are looking forward to. Well, well we, we told ourselves that. <laughs> <laughs> um, we, we really didn't establish anything and I had never done anything back in the odd like I wanted to do just mm. because it wasn't happening. Mm -hmm. um, so then uh, a couple of different jobs uh, transpired mm -hmm. and when I moved to Morden mm -hmm. in uh, 1998, mm -hmm. I didn't do... Wait, why'd you move to Morton? Well, I'd, I'd gone from the hotel, I yeah. worked at a hardware store, and I got offered a job, my introduction to Honda. Couple different jobs in yeah. Verdon, and then... And then I got, I got uh, a job in, at the Honda dealership in Verdon, and, and it got sour. I, I, I basically got the shaft that I won't get into, and I just said, I'm walking away from, sure, from this. Sure. Oh, no, we want you to do this. No, no, vite and, yeah. and I left. Um, uh, not you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I speak fluent Winklish. <laughs> it's not you, it's me. <laughs> so I, I, when I told our district sales manager what had happened and that I was going to be gone, he mm -hmm. said, don't leave your desk. 
because he knew of a guy in Morden that was looking for somebody that could sell. Okay, okay. And I got a phone call and I went down there. And you knew you were like, by that point, you're like a seasoned sales. Yeah, I, 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 got, I got six or seven days under my belt. Yeah. Um, so he, I got a job in Morden and that's what caused me to move down to Morden in 98. Okay. Still not doing any theater. Um, so there's been like... 98, that's like over 15, well, no, you did, you did some sputting around on stage. Yes. But no, like the last time you did real plays was like 84. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I mean, we did a couple of real plays at Russell, but they were organized mayhem. Okay. You know, there wasn't, there was no stage manager. There was, there was no nothing. Yeah. We just went on. There wasn't even sets. Wow. We all did it. We, we didn't know it. We were doing black box. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, this is fascinating. So, yeah. so after I had the job in Warden, uh -huh. and then I was offered a job at Southland Honda that I moved to, mm -hmm. 2001, mm -hmm. still not doing any shows, uh, got into a relationship wherein my significant other says, you, you're not doing that. You haven't got time. Okay. okay. So the moment that that relationship was over, I moved to Manitou, which is about... 30 minutes west of Morden. Okay. Small town, 800 people. Okay. Felt like home immediately. And it just so happens that there's an opera house in Manitou huh. that I didn't know anything about. One day I got a, I was, I was leaving to go to work mm -hmm. and I'd heard that there was a dinner theater that was going to be taking place at the local tavern mm -hmm. in Manitou. Mm -hmm. And I knew one of the guys that was going to be involved in it. He happened to be in the coffee shop when I was getting my coffee for the road in the morning. I said, Hack. Where is the coffee shop? It's right on number three highway. It's red. In Manitou. In Manitou. Okay. So I was getting my blast of coffee yeah. to make the half hour journey to work. Uh -huh. And I said, is there any tickets for that dinner theater? He said, yeah. I said, set me aside one. And if you're doing anything like this again, let me know. Do you do this kind of stuff? Well, I've done it in the past. It's yeah. fun. Sure. I'd love it. Yeah. So yeah, that, I, I told Daryl Hack to you know, let me know if yeah. there's anything going on. He's the coffee guy. He's the coffee guy. Yeah. The next day I get a phone call uh -huh. at work. Yeah, this is Richard Clausen. You've been speaking to uh, Daryl Hackalt about uh, dinner theater. Went, oh yeah, I'm guessing you want, probably want a visa number to pay for the ticket. He says, no, he said that you'd be interested in doing something. I said, yeah, sure, I've done a little bit. Yeah, because um, you know, we're, we're a little bit short. One of our four guys just bailed on us and, and we're looking for a fourth guy. I said, would you be interested? Sure. When is it? It's tomorrow. <laughs> that was my introduction to Candlewick Productions. We really weren't Candlewick then. We were just four guys. We called ourselves the Shaven Apes. <laughs> Candlewick is Richard Clausen. That is Richard Clausen, and it's a theater group run out of a production Maine. company that's run out of La Riviere, which is just like a stone's throw down. <laughs> There's all these little darts. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> if anything, you're getting a geography lesson. I know. Well, I am, but like trying to pin down this story. Okay. So, so, so I had a 24 hour notice uh -huh. for my first ever association with Richard Clausen. Okay. And a lot of it was improv and we had to do some memorization, which was easy peasy. Yeah. Um, but it was, it was an improv dinner theater. How many people showed up? What was it the like? The bar was full. Yeah. Like, I mean, it's a small bar. Um, uh, I don't know, 120 people. Wow, it what was, was that like? It was great. Yeah, it was great. We did a we did a thing from the Drew Carey blue collar comedy thing. Okay, where they're they're all sitting on their deck, and mm -hmm. they're complaining about how their deck's too small, and this one's you know it's all tongue in cheek and mm -hmm. a little bit of uh, a little bit of innuendo, and here I am, uh, I got a Budweiser beer in my hand. Yeah, because we're in the bar and. And we can. Yeah. Uh, Richard doesn't drink, so he had a dad's root beer that looks like he oh, nice. So he's drinking. Yeah. yeah. But it was it was fun. It was a lot of fun. And and then Richard just kept asking me to do roles and asking me to do this and that and and yeah, I, I done a, a few plays. I got down in La Riviere. So starting in ninety eight. Then that kind of ninety eight and I, I didn't do my first actual show until 2005. Okay, but you've done you did a lot of these littler things, um, or no, or just this one. Nothing in between. Like oh. from the from from '98 when I moved down till I met Richard, nothing, not a thing. There was just a big hole in. Oh, so 2005 is when this happened. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So from 2005 on, and then it's I, on. It's on. I've, I've been. I'm. A, I'm on the Candlewick board, and I've done Flatland show and Candlewick. So show. then, I mean, that's. And then, does that really like between being uh, Chuck from Southland Honda 
and doing the theater? Is that really like, do you feel like those are the two real parts of your identity? Those would be two major parts. Yeah. What other parts are there? Well, I mean, I, I have a significant other, and yeah. and she's got four children. Mm -hmm. So I'm a, I'm a partner. I'm um, I'm I'm I, I wouldn't. I have I've been called by by younger people in theater. It's a little embarrassing. Well, Chuck is kind of a mentor. Jeez, that's the blind leading the blind, isn't it? <laughs> but it is like it's it's a pretty cool thing when and, and, and the kid that did this. Yeah. Uh, I just played Perchik and Fiddler on the Roof. Okay. So obviously Perchik, that crazy student. Yeah, yeah. That guy from Kiev. Yeah. Remember <laughs> at the wedding? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Gotcha. Um, um, so, and that's Richard's kid, Xander. Okay. He, he introduced me to his, well, now fiance as this is Chuck, and he's kind of been a mentor to me. And, I, and, and then I, he was in our production of 12 Angry Men that we just completed. And I, yeah. I says, that was really. A huge compliment, considering where your status is as a as a stage player. Wow! And and then he reminded me that when we did Fiddler on the Roof originally, which would have been fourteen, fifteen years prior, uh huh, he was just a little cleaner, yeah, and wanted so bad to be in the show because yeah. he knew it. Yeah, he'd been to every rehearsal because he was like five. Yeah. Um. And he wanted so bad to be in it, and Richard wouldn't let him because he just didn't have time to deal with his kid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I went to Richard and said, Xander wants to be in this thing. I, like, I played the part of the constable, right? Mm. So I'm hanging with Russians. I said, we could put him in a Cossack outfit, and he's just a sm very small Russian. <laughs> it's, it's all good. And yeah. he can come on stage, and he can do... And Richard just turned on me, and when the show's on, everybody gets a little on edge. And yeah. Richard's no exception. He just, you look after him. So for the next week, Xander literally was on my belt loop. That yeah. was the rule. You have to stay with me. You cannot wander away from me. I need to know where you are the whole time. Yeah. So he just latched on to me. Wow. And, and he was ecstatic. He didn't have yeah. a line. He didn't have anything to do. He just got to be in the show. The which is where relationship begins. And then when we did the second go around of Fiddler mm -hmm. a couple of years ago, mm -hmm. he was playing Perchick. Mm -hmm. And we had this adorable little five-year-old that... Her mother is an accomplished singer. Yeah. And, and Addie wanted to be in the show, so yeah. she was. Mm -hmm. But she also wanted to see her favorite songs, one yeah. of which was Matchmaker. Uh -huh. And there's kind of a rule once we get to dress rehearsal stage, you're not in the wings. You're backstage. Okay. And Addie wanted so bad to see it, and she was making a scene, and her mother just said, go talk to Chuck, because I was assistant director for this show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I looked over to where she wanted to watch. Well, there's Xander waiting for his entrance as Perchik. And I said, just went full circle. I said, Xander, this is Addie, who he knew. Uh -huh. I said, she's going to watch Matchmaker. You're going to make sure that she's out of sight line of all the audience. Uh -huh. And then when it's done, Addie, you're backstage. And when I told Richard that, Richard said, we don't do that. And I said, let's go back to a, a small little kid named Xander who wanted so bad to be in the show. It yeah. was his turn to look after the, the kid. Huh. And... So yeah, it's, it's weird how that kind of stuff happens. It just went full circle. And also, I mean, that, that's such a great, I mean, so, so representative of the fact that like, you've been with that group for that long. Yeah, um, 2005 to present day. I, yeah. I couldn't begin to tell you how many shows we've done. I've done as many as five shows in one year with two different companies. Mm -hmm. That's too much. Yeah. But, uh, I would say over the over the time I've probably averaged three shows a year. Okay. Plus plus extraneous ones like yeah. when you do the the Good Friday service at the uh, community at the community service for Good Friday. Yeah. There's there's that's a show that you it's not postered or advertised. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah, just yeah, your yeah. responsibility to put on this. So we did the Trial of Christ. Pontius. <laughs> <laughs> So you said you played Pontius five times? Five different times. What are the five times? Uh, two in the King, uh -huh. because we did it at the Act Fest, and then we did it again in Russell. Uh -huh. uh, and where's this guy, this lawyer guy? Is he, he passed away, unfortunately. I went looking for him because I lost the script. Yeah. And I finally got a hold of his daughter, and he said, unfortunately, he had a heart attack a couple wow. of years ago, and we lost him. But yeah. It was, it's a great loss. He was just so eclectic yeah and eccentric yeah and, yeah and, yeah you know a, a real all-around good and he liked to have a wee dram 
So you'd always want to have a, well, maybe we'll have a weed So, run. I mean, you've really, like, also this story of you, go, like, tracking from, like, Verdon to Russell to Thompson. I mean, I guess Russell and Thompson, not quite as much, but Verdon and Morton, really, and a bit in Russell, the, the story of theater, local theater in Manitoba as well. Yeah, yeah, like, uh, I, 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 I guess I... I People have just said, like, they've looked at me and they say, you've done that many shows? Like, yeah. that, that's kind of like your crack, isn't it? I guess it would be my drug of choice. Uh, it, do you, like, can you talk, like, what does theater, um, what does it mean to you? And what does it mean to, like, I guess communities? Um, it's, I guess it varies. Not everybody likes theater. Yeah. Right? Not, ever, not everybody appreciates uh, somebody that does an accent for an, for a two hour play, some, sure, some people sure. hate that. Mm -hmm. uh, some of the comedy that you that you either you write mm -hmm. or that you purchase and mm -hmm. get the rights to do, yeah. some of it's pretty hokey. Yeah, you know, some and some of it's dated. Yeah, like if you're doing an Oscar Wilde piece, it's pretty dated. Yeah. if you're doing a Stuart Lemoyne piece, there's a little more thrust there. That's a little more current. Let's yeah. say, even though it might be set in in earlier times. Yeah, there's a there's a you know. Uh, when did you sort of, at what point did, were you, like, you, you get dared to, to, to do a play. At what point are you a convert? At what point? Oh, it, it, it was like a weekend. But like, you're like naming, like, like, you're like naming like playwrights and you're naming plays and all that. Like, at what oh, point, I'm a full-fledged geek. When did you, when did you feel like you had that, like, confidence with, um, with the material with the I, world I, I i guess i guess it would it would have come post 2005 when okay when when richard asked me to do a couple of shows i mean my first full show was les miserables yeah um and, and with manitou with yeah with candlewick and we did candlewick, it, we did, yeah we did it in in larvier at, uh -huh. at where they have the passion play Okay. Uh, the Oak Valley site. Yeah. Open air version of Hugo's Les Miserables, non musical edition. Okay. Um, it's my first time working with six year olds. Yeah. It's my first time in a cast of 50. It's my yeah. first time doing everything outside. Yeah. And because the passion plays that, 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 that whole area is protected, right? Okay. Like we didn't lose the production to rain. Yeah. There was rain all around. Yeah. But it didn't rain on us. Hmm. You know? It's protected. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and it's still a fascinating place to go to. Yeah. Uh, just to sit. Uh -huh. It's a very contemplative. I mean, it's right in the valley. It's a natural amphitheater. Wow. You're right up against the... Uh, and and they have the passion play. They've done the passion play there forever. 30 yeah. years. Yeah. Uh, I've been to see it once. Because Xander was Christ. <laughs> but Richard plays uh, uh, Caiaphas, uh -huh. the chief priest. Okay. Now, after seeing him actually yeah. on stage, because other than some improv stuff, mm -hmm. he's always directing yeah. or working the board. Yeah. But when he comes out as Caiaphas, he owns that stage. Wow. He, he like that's where you see a oh, whole cow. He, this is in Les Mis. I don't know Les Mis. Well, no, this this is in the Passion Play. Oh, the okay. okay. Les Mis is well, it's it's Jean Valjean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, guy steals a loaf of bread and gets. You know, Who's Caiaphas in the Passion Play? He's the chief priest. Okay. He's the one that wants to get rid of Christ because he's given everybody all these crazy ideals. Mm. And that's Richard's role. And it's always been Richard's role. Yeah. Like he knows the part. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Uh, and, and he commands the stage. It's not a huge role. Uh -huh. I mean, it's a significant role, but it's in terms of lines and stage time, it's not that big. Yeah. But when he's, as soon as he walks out of the temple doors, it's wow. Like he's mm. got the whole stage mm -hmm. and it's a big stage. It's mm -hmm. like three times what you'd see inside someplace mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and, and he, it's his mm -hmm. as soon as he walks out. Um, so when did I start really getting into and getting comfortable and mm -hmm. as the years gone go by, I get asked to do more and more plays mm -hmm. and, and then I got asked to be on the board mm -hmm. and then now we're selecting plays. Mm -hmm. So now you're reading, yeah. you're, you're reading plays, you're yeah. doing stuff. And I quite fell into the whole being a director aspect of it. Oh, you did? Yeah, it's by my bossy nature. 
we were getting ready for a Christmas dinner theater, which yeah. is, it's theater in the round. Yeah. And there's lots of local businesses and whatnot that yeah. come to, so there's lots of name mentions. Get more coffee. Absolutely. By the way, this coffee, it, it, Chuck brought this coffee. This is, this is Chuck's own blend of coffee well, from I, I, I buy it from straight from Manitou. Straight, actually, I, <laughs> I, I, live in, I live in Morden now and down the street from my place is a, uh, a little bakery, in-house bakery mm -hmm. called uh, uh, Wheat Song. Wheat Song. Wheat Song Bakery. Wheat Song. Wheat. Wheat Song. Wheat Song Bakery. Bakery. And they sell these things. These are the beans that you can buy at 10,000 Villages. 10,000 Villages. It's, it's a bean. Colombian whole bean dark. Mm. Uh, and I, I would call myself a coffee snob. Yeah. Because not, it's good. It, it's got less caffeine. It is good. It's a good coffee. I like a lighter roast. I know. We That's had this good. argument. But it... <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to... So... And it is good coffee. So... It was a Christmas dinner theater. Yeah. And it, it is good coffee, delicious coffee. Thank you, 10,000 Villages. Thank you to the nation of Colombia. Uh, no, Ethiopia. It's, oh, you said Colombian. Did I? Yeah, oh, in, it's, Colum it's, it's Ethiopian. It's Ethiopian. Ethiopian blend coffee. You know, I went to Ethiopia a couple years ago, and I remember I was on the plane, and you know, every time you fly, they're like, do you want to have coffee, tea, anything? I said, I'll have a coffee. Drank a cup of coffee on the plane flying to Ethiopia, and I was like, this is the best coffee I've ever had in my life. This yeah. is going to be a good experience in cool. Ethiopia. Cool. And it was Ethiopian coffee? Oh, yeah. Like, I don't think yeah. they, nothing but. I can do a medium roast. Yeah. Like Argentina, like they make a, a yeah. nice medium roast and a yeah. ra Arabica. But the, these, decaf. I was, mm. I was wondering, water. Yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah. I, I don't get it. Yeah. And, and I'm at the age that I'm at. I, it, a day without coffee, that really is a day without Chuck Sunshine. I get a little headachey and maybe even a little bit brunch. <laughs> <laughs> the chicken man has left the building. Yes, exactly. Um, so, so uh, started reading plays, you got into directing. Right. Um, a Candlewick rehearsal, yeah. especially as it gets down, if you have a good dress rehearsal, mm -hmm. you're a little nervous. Mm -hmm. Like you're looking for a disaster, so it happens on dress rehearsal as opposed yeah, yeah, to opening yeah. night. Yeah. And we were, Richard happened to be very, very ill, and, and we were getting ready to do a series of, of nights that was Timbers, the golf course in, okay. in Morden. Yeah. He was up in the gondola getting everything, sound and lights rigged up. Uh -huh. And there was just so much disorganization and confusion, and yeah. then there was uh, useless chit chat and joking around. And I was tired, and it wasn't going well, and we were less than 48 hours away from opening, and we just couldn't get this one scene to timing of it. Mm. And I just started barking orders. Hmm. Look, you gotta come in when that line comes in. Yeah. And, and, yeah. And, it just, and we ran it, and it went smooth, we ran it again, and it went good, great. It, the next day, I got a text from one of my, one of my castmates. Was, that was really cool when you started directing us. Because I just did it. Yeah. And, yeah. And, she's, and, and I said, directing? Yeah, yeah. When you started barking orders and it just all fell into place. This group I immediately it. called Richard and apologized. And he went, oh, no, I heard you. you everything you said was right. You're going to have to start doing a little more of that. So mm. I have done a little more of that. Wow. And you like it. Yeah. The yeah. power. It's not. I, I like doing it because I understand. <laughs> yeah, because there's power in that, right? <laughs> <laughs> You've got 12 directors in your cast and you're there's trying to no, organize There's them. no facade it's whatsoever. It's like herding cats. You're not, you're not going to like... There's no flower. It's the power. No, it's the directing absolutely is not. The power. Yeah. It's absolutely not. I, I it. fell into directing but you, because I, want, I wanted to be an actor. Right. And I, um, out of high school, I realized I'm not a model. So it's going to be, I'm going to, oh, if I disagree, if I want to be, <laughs> I went into the hairdresser and said, give me a pole play. <laughs> if I want to be, if I want to, uh, be, pursue a career as an actor, it's going to be purely based off of talent. Right. Right. And I was like, that's going to be tricky. Um, I mean, I like acting. I love acting, mm -hmm. but then, then, uh, I started directing and I realized, oh, I could cast myself in things. Right. If I'm the director. Right. And it sort of fell into it kind of that way. And then by and by loved 
um, yeah, just expressing myself and, yeah. and, 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 and I like writing as well, you know, sort of the creative aspect. I know that for me, the power. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> There's zero no. power. No, just thinking about it, right? Like, I mean, it is nice. Definitely, it's nice when people um, listen to you. It, and it's nice when you can. I love the dance. Right. I love. How do you getting, get more out of that I person without getting, being a complete jerk? Well, yeah. Well, for sure. I mean, never. I would never want to be a jerk. But I like. I love it when actors are clicking, and I make movies. So mm -hmm. when actors are clicking, and and the and the other departments, the technical departments are working, and then just sort of getting in with the actors and playing, playing with the scene. That I love fine, doing. Fine tuning it. And yeah, it's, I, the flow I, state, the vision. I, this is what I envision happening. Yeah. And when this line is being said, you should yeah. be walking toward him and then stop when he gets to this word because you don't like it. Now you have to turn around, and and they're all like. Really, you're really kind of getting exact, but you're when you're directing, you get to do that. Yeah. When I do a show with Richard, mm -hmm. if I'm not directing and on stage, yeah. I'm at the very least assistant director. It yeah. just happens. And I, when we do a summer show, which is like a big deal, yeah. Um, I. I work with characterization. Yeah. So while he's doing the big picture and the two people having the conversation yeah. in the front, yeah. I'm in the back saying, what are you doing here? Yeah. Well, you can't be doing that. Yeah. You can't be doing nothing. You yeah. have to be, you're cleaning the window. You're it's, cobbling shoes. Yeah. You're it's funny when you talk about the vision because I never had that specific of a vision. Oh. For anything. I, I'll agree with you. Like, because sometimes... Sometimes the actor's just not in the headspace that they feel comfortable doing what you'd like them to do, so you gotta come up with something else. Well, I just think about the director, the way I like directing, is when everybody is contributing, you know? It becomes and, an organic thing. And the director, it's all your job, at the, in the best case scenario, is to just take a step back and be a proxy for the viewer. Yep. And be like, well, if we just finesse this a bit, you know, but it's not like, it's oftentimes when there's, I just, l again, love it when other people are solving problems. If you, you have know? an experienced cast. And crew, they, you they, know, and, well, and our department and everybody. Right. Yeah. But they, they, they do tend to solve their own problems. Yeah. Um, and, and we saw that on the set of Marie and the Menos. Yeah. How many times were, yeah, yeah. you know, the, the cameraman just said, well, yeah. no, I'm, get, I'm getting this. I'm getting Chuck this. is one of the lead actors in our uh, TV show, Maria and the Menos as well. That's how I um, got to know Chuck. Yeah. It's not where you met me. No, met you somewhere else. But that's how we. That's how we got to know yeah, each other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well. Um, that's why I'm here. Because he's not paying. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to cut that bit. Um, so, so yeah, I, vision is just the word I use. It might no, no, wait, I know, but there's a lot of directors, even on the show, there's a lot of directors that do have a very specific vision. And for them, it's all about, we, we need to build this diorama that I have so that in my head. So here. it's exactly this thing. And it's not exact like and, and it's 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 because i have this very specific idea right and i just don't i'm just not like i would rather collaborate with a bunch of people i want us all to pull in the same direction right i want to make sure we're heading in that direction but i just don't approach it in that way and every show is different too well like, yeah and I mean, if, if you're doing a comedy yeah. and, and and you're actually not in the show yeah all you want to be is on the stage first yeah. of all because that's really where the fun is yeah 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 um but when you're in the show and directing, depending on the show, it can be very challenging because yeah. you don't have an audience. Yeah. Because as a director, you can sit and I know I, I can yeah. see that. We just did Twelve Angry Men. Yeah. So th there's no escape from that stage. Mm -hmm. Once you're on, mm -hmm. not only are you on stage, you are on in yeah. character yeah. for the whole three acts. Yeah. Uh, and and it was we had it all set up. Mm -hmm. My co-director and myself had it all set up. And then when we got to the actual, to the Morden Kenmore to yeah. do this and get set up on stage, yeah. we saw some sight line challenge. Well, Richard just says, Chuck, come here. Okay, you and you switch places and you got to get over to here because it's 
12 men at a table, yeah. and if that's the audience, you don't want five guys there. So we yeah. had three, but we had to kind of space them out because the main one of the main characters sitting right here next yeah, to yeah. me, the other one's at the end of the table. Yeah, you, you have to block it in a logical way. Yeah. yeah. So uh, Richard's set of eyes was very much appreciated when mm. he had some time. Yeah. And he just called himself the producer. Yeah. But he came in and for three rehearsals, he just kind of tweaked a couple of scenes. Mm -hmm. and, and I don't get, I don't get possessive about no. something. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. we had, we had a blockbuster cast. Wow. Like amazing. Cast. It was, yeah. We called it the dream team. Oh, that's um, awesome. And, and, and it was a reunion of sorts. Uh, the guy that played Jean Valjean to my Javert and Les Mis, uh -huh. he was sitting right next to me on stage. I hadn't done a show with him in over 10 years. Oh, so that was fantastic. Cool. But when we had our pre-meeting, I said, I'm looking around the room and I see like eight or nine different directors. Mm -hmm. Let me assure you guys, there's only two. Yeah. So we want input, yeah. lots yeah. of input. They even made backstories. I yeah. challenged them to make backstories. And some of the backstories at the supper afterwards yeah. were pretty amazing. Like, yeah, uh, pretty, pretty. It's something they, uh, they taught us at, at film school. They said, how many directors are on set? Yeah. As many as you let there be. Yes. And, and eventually you just have to say, okay, we're a week out. Yeah. And it's time for you to just do as you're told. What's your role? Yeah. What's your role here? Yeah. You know, if your role is to be the director... I've, the I've taken some input yeah. and yeah. I've, some of it I've said, yeah, we'll, we can yeah. use that. And some of them I said, nah, I don't like that. Yeah. So, born yes. in Verdun. Yes. Going to let me know when you've grown up. I'll let you know. Um, the chicken man. Yeah. Chicken chef. You're saying it. Chicken man. Chicken man. Chicken man. There you go. <laughs> uh, chicken chef in Russell. Thompson, move to Morden, Manitou, theater. Yeah. Chuck from Southland Honda. Yeah. With all of your life experience and where you're at with life now, do you have any, any sort of central theme, idea? Do you have a message for the world? You know, I was thinking, of, I knew you were going to ask this question. Yeah. Um, I did a podcast with the aforementioned Jody Zarn. Mm -hmm. I uh, she's done a TED talk. She's a, an amazing person. Yeah. Uh, philanthropic, a very caring, giving person. Um, and I did a podcast and we basically called it things that light your bum on fire. Like what, what, and, and, and theater and, and helping get a show from reading table read mm -hmm. to opening night that puts your bum on fire. Yeah. That, that, that'll light you up. And I've always said, you know, I, I do it to an empty hall. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I guess I almost have in some cases where there's just been no, but there's nothing like a full house. Yeah. There's nothing like that full house, especially in a small venue. So when I say full house, 250 people. Yeah. Uh, but it's like they're looking into your living room. And if you've done your homework and you've made your backstory and you are truly in character, it's not Chuck on stage. It's Reverend Lionel Toop. It's, it's you know, Javert from Les Mis. Uh, when we did Les Miserables mm -hmm. and Matthew was playing Jean Val, and we had a lot of fun doing it. But come opening night, Chuck didn't want anything to do with Matt. He was down walking backstage in the limp that Jean Valjean had from carrying the ball and chain. And I, as Javert, was up. In, on the platform about to come out of my office and I just hate him. No, I didn't. Like, we always had a, a great chat after the show, but pre-show, no. I guess I would be considered more of a method actor, uh, but I'm, I'm able to leave that uh, most of the time. Mm -hmm. Some, sometimes it, it follows you home mm -hmm. and that's okay because you've got to do it tomorrow and the next day and then you've got a matinee on Sunday too. So. Um, what that does, though, it, it gives you the hangover. Mm. Uh, the, you know, we just finished 12 Angry, and Monday was like, I don't want to people. Mm. I don't want to do any peopling today. Mm -hmm. But you have to, because you haven't, you haven't shopped in a week. Mm -hmm. yet you've got to go and get you know, water for the, you know, for, to make this great coffee. You've you got to go and get all these things. Yeah. So, yeah, 
that's what I like about it, is is being totally enveloped in it. Yeah. And and it works. Yeah. At least it works for me. Yeah. Um, because when you're using one side of your brain at work, numbers, figures, and you're meeting and greeting, and you're showing things about this car versus that car, and getting payments, and then you have to turn that off and put on the other side of your brain and be creative. Yeah. It's a bit of a challenge, uh, depending on how your day has gone at work. Yeah. You got to forget about that. Yeah. And likewise, when you go to work next morning, you got to forget how good or how bad the rehearsal went the night before. You just hmm. got to go and do your thing. So seeing a show from, from beginning to end lights your bum on fire. Oh, man. Why? That, uh, if I knew that, I'd, I'd probably be able to do it for a living like you do. I, I don't know why. It's, it's just exciting. It just it gets your heart ticking. Um, when, when I won the part of Hank and Maria, mm -hmm. I had... Now that's, that, and that's completely different. Mm -hmm. Um, I didn't know what I was into until two weeks in. Mm -hmm. And then, okay, now, now I know uh, what they want. You, they being, you know, you and Orlando and, mm -hmm. and Tina, what all the producers and the mm -hmm. directors, what do, they, what do they want? Yeah. What are they looking for? And that's where I learned about, you know, the arc mm -hmm. um, as to where this episode fits in in that arc. Sure. Um, I, I don't know why it lights me on fire. I guess if you're going to tell a story, you might as well tell it well. So many moons ago, we'd tell a story, but there'd be ad libs and improvs and there'd be pranks on stage. Yeah, we don't do that. No, we don't, we don't prank each other. No more. The audience didn't pay 25 bucks a seat to hear you spot. Unless it's an improv dinner theater, and then that's completely different. But if you're on stage, if you're on the boards, you have to get the thought across. Because this playwright had this in mind when he wrote it. And you, you making a joke, you're actually you're, you're butchering his work, and that's not fair. And if I came into your place of work and made fun of what you're doing, you probably wouldn't appreciate it. Well, we're trying to do this justice. Maybe you don't appreciate it, but, but the other 99% might. Mm. Um, having said that, I'm probably the, uh, the biggest yapper backstage as far as... <laughs> no, but, but what you're saying is, is it's, a, it's a respect for the art. It's, it's, a, it's a respect for the art, exactly. Um, and, the, and the arts, pre-COVID, like we were on a roll, right? And I don't know what it was like in the city, but we were planning... 10 and 12 months out. We knew when we wrapped up the summer show what the next summer show was going to be. Yeah. Well, Chuck, um, I... Uh, Has it been three hours already? <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I, uh, since the moment that I met you, I've, I've just thought that you are, I mean, you're a phenomenal actor. Thank you. But you're a fascinating human being. It's so wonderful to hear a little bit more of your story, of your background. I know that it, it sort of puts some of the pieces together. Explains a lot, don't it? Yeah, just to think of... <laughs> you know, you know, I just think that... that um, yeah, I, I'm so thankful that I've that I've had the the opportunity to to meet you and to get to know you and to even be able to collaborate you with you in in the the small way that we've gotten a chance to right. to collaborate. Together. You're a you're a tough audition though. He's like dead <laughs> I I thought I'd driven an hour for an audition and completely wasted your time. I, I did. But that's, that, that's you just not tipping your hand, that's all. I would love to tell the story of Chuck's audition for Marie in the Meadows <laughs> another time. Um, no, I want to unpack the whole show uh, at another time. But, but I, just, I do think, think that, uh, no, you're, you're, you're one of a kind. Well, and I appreciate that. And, um, and, and I've, the time that we have had yeah. on set and, and personal... You are as well, mm -hmm. and, and I, you know, I watch your videos. Mm -hmm. I know a little bit of your story. Yeah. Uh, listening to to your father uh, talk in his podcast. Yeah. It. Uh, yeah. Okay. So yeah, you're artsy fartsy. <laughs> you're creative. 
then, then that's good. That's, you know, water finds its own level. That's why you and I get along, I think. <laughs> yeah. So, how much of this do you think he's going to have to actually <laughs> edit? Just, you know. I just want to thank you for coming out, bringing the coffee. My pleasure. Um, Merry it, Christmas. Yeah, Merry Christmas. <laughs> and uh, hopefully we can have conversations like this in the future. Anytime. Appreciate it. Thanks, Chuck. Thanks, bud. <laughs>